From the moment WCW Nitro rolled out on TNT, there wasn't anything meek about Eric Bischoff's creation. In fact, aggression was its currency. The WCW Executive VP took the fight right to Vince McMahon and his better established World Wrestling Federation, spotlighting the purported superiority of Nitro to Monday Night Raw. Lex Luger's surprise return on the Nitro premiere was an indicator that maybe the big stars would rather be here. Bischoff's dismissive reading of warmed-over Raw spoilers highlighted the apparent staleness of the competition. These actions would have you believe that, compared to WCW, the WWF was little more than wretched garbage. So much so that by the end of 1995, Bischoff authorised a literal demonstration of that notion with the help of a recent defection. Before we get into the heart of the matter, let's look back over the prior two years and properly explain the state of women's wrestling in the then World Wrestling Federation. By late 1993, nearly five years had passed since the WWF women's title was contested for on a national broadcast. Despite that period of dormancy, the WWF decided to reinstate the belt, though the timing was rather curious. The only established woman on WWF television was Luna Vachon, who by this time was seconding Bam Bam Bigelow. They'd lost former women's champion Sensational Sherry over the summer, so a new division was going to require some fresh acquisitions. Fortunately, there was a credible star on the market, one that checked all the boxes necessary to be the face of any women's division. Her name was Medusa. The two-time IWA and AWA Women's Champion was no stranger to wrestling fans, though her highest profile work in the preceding years came mostly as a non-wrestler. In WCW the previous year, Medusa served as a valet of sorts to Rick Rude and Paulie Dangerously's Dangerous Alliance, but the veteran wrestler was hardly some damsel in distress. Rather, Medusa was prone to getting physically involved in matches involving men, and also didn't suffer misogyny lightly. When her and Dangerously had an on-screen falling out in late 1992, he made one sexist comment too many, upon which she handily kicked his ass to the roar of the crowd. Though she and Dangerously faced off in a series of five-minute challenges at ensuing live events, neither was long for the promotion. Medusa left WCW in early 1993 for what was reported to be disagreements over her usage as a performer. Before 1993 came to a close, she signed with the WWF, where she was given the new name Alundra Blaze. She was placed in a curiously designed six-woman tournament to crown a new women's champion, the majority of which didn't air on WWF television and was mostly confined to dark matches. Just as odd, Blazer's semi-final victory over Allison Royal took place not at a WWF taping, but at a USWA card in Memphis. The final round pitted Blaze against a woman she'd worked with in several of the promotions, Heidi Lee Morgan. Said finals took place at a Monday Night Raw taping in December 1993, though the match didn't air on the flagship Raw program. Instead, for reasons unclear, the all-important finals aired on the increasingly irrelevant All-American Wrestling program on a Sunday morning 13 days after it was filmed. As for the match itself, Blaze captured the gold to no one's surprise, pinning Morgan with a bridging German suplex. For the two years that followed, Blaze remained the undisputed face of the WWF's women's division, not that that face was frequently on display for the world to see. For one thing, it took seven months for Blaze to actually wrestle a match on Monday Night Raw. Out of the 100 plus matches Blaze wrestled for the WWF in 1994, only six of them were televised, two of which occurred on pay per view. When Blaze dropped the belt three weeks shy of realizing a one year reign as champion, the title switch occurred not at a WWF event, but at an All Japan women's card, losing to rival Bull Nakano at the Tokyo Dome. The result was acknowledged on WWF television, but when you're outsourcing your title changes, it's not really a sign that you have ambitious plans for your division. Of course, this had been apparent for the previous year anyway. 
For the most part, the WWF women's division of the day consisted of Blaze herself, an aggressive heel rival, and, if applicable, a hapless babyface that the aforementioned heel could rip apart in order to prove worthy of a shot at Blaze's title. For the latter half of 1994 and the first third of 1995, the women's scene was strictly Blaze and Nakano facing off on house shows, save for their few TV bouts against each other. And come 1995, Nakano dropped the title back to Blaze before leaving the company. Replacing her as Blaze's executive opponent was veteran powerhouse Rhonda Singh, who made her reputation worldwide as an unyielding villain under the name Monster Ripper. But because it's 1995 WWF and ha-ha comedy was the medium, Singh was repackaged as a trailer park princess named Bertha Fay, with extra comedic attention placed on her garish attire and fuller frame. Reportedly, Singh was also asked not to perform the same power moves as her male counterparts, forcing her to rely more on the one-note caricaturing in her matches. Despite the hindrances to Faye as a character and performer, she still won Blaze's title at the 1995 SummerSlam. But she didn't reign for too long, as Blaze regained the title on an episode of Raw two months later. With that win, Alundra Blaze was now a three-time women's champion, having cleanly avenged the first two losses. To set up Blaze with new challengers, a plan was in place for 1996. The idea was to send Blaze to wrestle for All Japan Women as a regular, while bringing her and some fresh opponents back sporadically to work major WWF pay-per-views, thus keeping the ailing women's scene on life support for the time being. To set up the next challenger, an eight-woman elimination match was put together for the 1995 Survivor Series, with Blaze and Faye each captaining a team. Their partners all came from All Japan Women, as Blaze teamed with Chaparita Asari, Kyoko Inoue, and Sakie Hasegawa to face Faye and teammates Lioness Asuka, Tomoko Watanabe, and Aja Kong. Blaze had a rather notable history with Kong, dating back more than half a decade. The two had faced off in a brutal street fight in July of 1990, and Kong more than fit the mold of a monster heel that could give fits to superheroine Blaze. That's exactly the direction WWF went in, having Kong survive the eight-woman match in what turned out to be a 10-minute sprint, due in part to the All Japan women flying in on an 18-hour flight after wrestling in Yokohama that Saturday. Kong scored every elimination for the heel side. Blaze was forced to try and fight back from three against one, putting away Watanabe and Fei before finally succumbing to Kong's brute power. The Blaze Kong title match was tapped for the 1996 Royal Rumble, and with the troop from All Japan women at their disposal, the WWF put them to good use at the post Survivor Series tapings. At the Raw tapings the night after Survivor Series, a tag team match was filmed, where Kong partnered with Watanabe to defeat Blaze and Inoue. Kong also filmed a singles match where she defeated Asari. That singles match aired on Monday, December 11th, which just so happens to be the same week that the Blaze Kong title match was suddenly rendered moot. And that brings us to the subject of this video. Two days after Kong's victory over Asari aired on Raw, Blaze's WWF contract expired and was not renewed. Some sources have claimed that she was released outright due to cost-cutting measures. Per Blazer's recollection of events, she did receive an official FedEx from the company confirming that her services were no longer required. Around the time Blazer's deal lapsed, J.J. Dillon, Vince McMahon's right-hand man in talent relations at the time, notified All Japan Women that the Blaze Kong title match for the Rumble was cancelled. Dave Meltzer posits that the decision to drop Blaze must have been made some time before the Kong Asari match aired, as Blaze wasn't mentioned one time by announcers McMahon and Jerry Lawler during the TV bout. As her scheduled challenger was picking up a victory, the women's champion had effectively been written out. It would be nearly three years before the WWF's women's title appeared once more on company programming, but it took far less time for the belt to show up in a rival promotion. The now former Alundra Blaze still had the WWF Women's title in her possession, and what happened next is subject of dispute, as the parties involved remember it a little different. According to Medusa, she received a call from longtime friend Eric Bischoff, who asked if she still had the belt. Bischoff says it was the opposite. She called him, asking if there was a place for her in WCW as she needed somewhere to work. What isn't in dispute is that Bischoff knew that he could shake up one hell of a hornet's nest if he could get that women's title onto Monday Nitro. More than three months had passed since free agent Lex Luger shocked the world by strolling out on Nitro's maiden broadcast, and in the competitive Monday Night Wars, Bischoff wasn't quite done throwing kicks at his opponent's groin. 
Indeed, Medusa brought the title belt to the December 18th episode of Nitro in Augusta, Georgia. According to Bischoff, even come show day, he hadn't quite made up his mind about what he wanted done with the belt, if even anything at all. If nothing else, he had the Exile Champion. Her simply appearing would have been enough of a Lugaresque surprise, the latest in a line of look who else jumped ship, even if the WWF wasn't all that broken up about letting her walk in the first place. But if she brought the belt onto Nitro, it'd look like WCW had signed away one of WWE's fighting champions, one seeking better competition elsewhere. To an audience that found itself increasingly warming to WCW, that perception might look like reality. And so the idea was pitched. Medusa would walk up to the commentary stage, hold the women's title aloft, and then deposit the belt into a wastebasket. In his book Controversy Creates Cash, Bischoff wrote about the predicament Medusa was in, saying she was pretty reluctant to do it. Quite frankly, I talked her into it. I'm sure to this day she wishes I hadn't. In a 2009 interview with the Miami Herald, Medusa claimed that she was given no choice since she was now under WCW contract, saying Eric Bischoff told me that I had to put the WWF women's title in the trash can on live television or that was it. If I was asked how I felt and if I would have done it by my own choice, the answer would have been no. But at the time, the wheels were well in motion. At about the 9 o'clock hour Eastern Time, Nitro beamed out live from Augusta, while Raw kicked off its post in your house broadcast from Newark, Delaware. Less than 90 seconds after Nitro kicked off, just after Bischoff and fellow announcers Bobby Heenan and Steve McMichael previewed a world title match pitting Macho Man Randy Savage against the Giant, a leather clad Medusa crashed the stage, microphone in hand. She introduced herself by that name, emphasizing that she had always been Medusa and she always would be. Then, from behind McMichael's broad shoulder, she produced the pink strap WWF women's title, which drew shocked responses, a worked one from a knowing Bischoff who could barely hide a smirk, and legitimate astonishment from the brain. Without wasting a moment, she picked up a nearby wastebasket, held it up, and let the belt plunge right into it. That's what I think of the WWF Women's Championship belt, she emphatically stated, while adding, they used to call me Alundra Blaze, but not anymore. This is where the big boys play, and now this is where the big girls play. Heenan sat speechless and slack-jawed, while McMichael crowed about the distress certain people in Connecticut must have been feeling. It's obvious what Mongo meant, but the real tension lay in Delaware, where McMahon provided live commentary on that night's Raw. Meltzer wrote in the Wrestling Observer that as Raw went on the air, McMahon learned of Medusa's stunt from one of his technicians. This accounts for McMahon's apparent distracted nature through the course of Raw's telecast that evening. But while Bischoff rejoiced in this latest shot at Vince, the fun was rather short-lived. As a result of the championship binning, the WWF initiated legal action, as bringing the WWF women's title onto WCW Nitro violated intellectual property trademarks. The legal fallout from the Ric Flair Big Gold Belt saga from four years prior had established the precedent that championships were the intellectual property of the parent organization. As a side note, you'd think given the role he played in that Flair ordeal, Heenan would be less than surprised to see a title belt show up in another promotion. Maybe he was just shocked that it happened twice. Additionally, this fact also destroys an accepted bit of history. When reigning WWF champion Bret Hart was leaving for WCW in 1997, the argument for the Montreal Screwjob was that WWF was worried that Hart would show up on Nitro with their belt, so they did what they had to do. Given the legal ramifications of Hart doing just that, as well as the fact that he was willing to drop the title to anyone else within the WWF, him showing up on Nitro with the belt in hand was not going to happen. If anything, the justification was that WWF likely needed Brett to lose the belt as quickly as possible so that Bischoff couldn't go on Nitro and announce that he'd signed away the reigning WWF World Champion. Because, you know, that would have really stung. As far as the non-legal fallout is concerned, WCW reportedly instituted a policy the following month, stating that all title holders have to leave their belts with the company following TV tapings, likely out of fear that the WWF would somehow retaliate. These were paranoid times, you know. The Medusa trash can moment has gotten plenty of play over the years, notably in the heralded Lonely Road of Faith music video, but ultimately, outside of giving Bischoff another chance to slap the competition around, it didn't really mean a whole lot. For one thing, it's not like the women's title had been an integral part of the WWF in its two years of renewed life. Alundra Blaze and her rivalries were treated more as a novelty than as a regular part of the show, as the earlier part of this video has established. 
Medusa throwing the belt away works well as a cathartic response to the subpar usage of her in those two years, but not so much as her putting a period at the end of the division's sentence. WWF had already punctuated that sentence themselves. And although a performer once again in WCW, Medusa didn't immediately benefit from the incident. She wouldn't appear on camera again until over a month after the trashing, attacking Sensational Sherry at her comedically disastrous wedding with Colonel Robert Parker. Throughout the year, Medusa wrestled sporadically for WCW in an intergender feud with Parker while also battling women such as Sherry, Malia Hasaka, and old rival Nakano. She lost to Akira Hokuto in the tournament final to crown the first ever WCW Women's Champion, whom she eventually lost a title versus career match to in 1997. Medusa then left wrestling for the better part of two years, before returning in 1999 as part of Randy Savage's entourage. She last wrestled at Fall Brawl 2000 and had been long gone from TV by the time McMahon acquired WCW's assets in the March 2001 sale. Though there didn't seem to be a clear path to reconciliation, Medusa found herself getting the call for a WWE Hall of Fame induction in 2015, albeit under her Alundra Blaze name. There, she competed the reversal of her prior act by symbolically removing the title belt from a trash can on stage and declaring the championship was back home where it belongs. Legal wrangling over intellectual property aside, that belt trashing was simply one shot in a series of shots between two warring promotions. But it really is emblematic of the spirit of the long past Monday Night Wars. Two sides firing shots as they jockeyed for supremacy while stooping to whatever means to debase the enemy. Few shots, of course, ever precisely equaled the rare visual of a former WWF star desecrating one of her ex-bosses' props on a rival program. Understandably, that particular shot's a little more memorable than most, a curious portrait of a shocking moment in time. 